We are, are thrilled to have you all here. We could not do these programs. They would not be possible if you all did not come out and support them. And, and the bookstore. We're actually celebrating our 20th year here as a bookstore, as the Doylestown Bookshop. And that is a, a real um, kudos to all of you. Yes. Your support has been incredible. So watch in May for a celebration for that. Um, but now I'm going to introduce to you the president of the Doylestown Historical Society, Stu Abramson. Well, thank you all for coming again. Is that okay in the back there? Good. Um, welcome to the last of our History at the Bookshop lectures, talks. Um, we've had a good time, as Glenda mentioned, uh, talking to everybody about Doylestown history. It's great to see a nice crowd once again, uh, especially since there's all these uh, marches and goings on in town. So uh, I guess a number of you just came here to find a seat and rest. <laughs> Um, but that's fine. And also, I, I notice a lot of the same uh, faces that were here for the last uh, two or three uh, talks that we've had. So that means that you must have enjoyed the last uh, few, and that, that's great as well. This one, our last one, will not be as festive as the, uh, the previous three. You know, we're, I guess our theme this year has been anniversaries. So we had the 100th anniversary of the borough doing something. We had the 200th anniversary of the township doing something. Well, keeping in that uh, mode uh, today, this is the 100th anniversary of uh, the Spanish influenza, which I didn't know much about at all. In fact, uh, the only one who knew anything about it is our chief archivist, Milt Kennan, and that's because he knows a lot about everything. And so uh, uh, this event uh, was not a happy, festive event. Uh, even though it was called the Spanish flu, you know, I mean, that's, uh, if you add a little flamingo music to that, that sounds pretty festive right there, but it was anything but festive. It killed a lot of people, and at the time it was considered, I think, the worst human disaster, natural disaster, in history at that time. So we thought we have, we better get a real good speaker to cover that one up, and I think we did. I think we, we found the most positive-oriented speaker we could possibly think of to address that issue, and that is the mayor of our fair town, Mayor Ron Strauss, and here he is. I'm going to try to use this up here, and we'll see whether you can hear in the back. Uh, I'll make a change if that doesn't work. Contrary to what you might think, I have no personal memories of the flu of 1918. And uh, uh, although I think Milt may. Is that true? <laughs> Obviously, no one in the room does. Um, uh, and, and as rightly pointed out, it's a hard conversation to have. Uh, with a, uh, any kind of uplifting uh, uh, message, uh, and frankly, the uplifting message that we'll get into, uh, to the extent there is one, uh, comes from the way this community uh, dealt with the, uh, the Spanish flu of 1918. Now, um, there's a lot of historical misinformation about the Spanish flu of 1918, and frankly, it begins with the title. The flu of 1918 had nothing to do with Spain, except Spain also suffered from it. The king of Spain had, had the flu, but he survived. It had to do, and, and as, as I go through this, you'll understand that more, it had to do with the war, the First World War. There was an embargo of information coming out of Europe. Spain was neutral. The embargo did not extend to Spain. So, a lot of the information coming out about the, the, the Spanish, the, the influenza of 1918 out of Europe came from Spain, and that, had, that contributed to the fact that we know it as the Spanish flu of 1918, but it is anything but. It is the flu of 1918, 1917, and 1919 that was uh, worldwide. 
Um, another reason is the European nations didn't want to let on that the flu was taking its toll on their countries because that would compromise the information that, would, that they'd like to come out that they were strong, healthy, robust to finish off the war. So we think of it as one epidemic, and that's not entirely wrong, but it had three phases, uh, and it spiked at different times throughout, throughout the world. Um, and there were three phases in the United States. There was a mild phase in the early part of the year, and then there's that part of it that takes place in late September through October uh, here in the United States that was the flu as we know it. And then there was another uh, mild reoccurrence that coming spring. Uh, that was in itself unprecedented in, in the, the history of these uh, pandemics. Uh, it's estimated that one third of the world got the flu. It's an enormous number of people. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the statistics that give that some, some, some depth. Uh, where did it begin? Everyone wants to know where it began. Uh, and the information as to where it began is actually fairly current. Of course, some people say it was Camp Houston, a military base in Kansas where the cook, Albert Getchell, fell ill on March 4th, 1918. But there were alternative theories that emerged um, while the pandemic was still raging, and they initially point to China. Uh, this was probably influenced in part by our Western attitudes toward China, uh, and in part the myth of the yellow pearl. Pearl. Uh, I have trouble saying that word. Uh, the American experience in World War I and the influenza pandemic uh, are all closely related and they are intertwined with our influence in China. And that begins uh, historically in about 1910 when there was a flu outbreak break in Manchuria. Uh, that flu outbreak break actually led to the uh, the ruling dynasty uh, falling in Manchuria, and revolution was in the air. Uh, Russia and Japan had run railroads into Manchuria uh, to take advantage of natural resources. Um, so the Chinese, to prevent, because of this destable uh, uh, environment, uh, they took aggressive action uh, to, to prevent foreign powers from invading. They controlled the plague. Uh, that was taking place at that time, even though an estimated 60,000 people died in China, in, in Manchuria, during that particular plague. There was a Western-educated doctor, educated in uh, Great Britain, uh, who headed the efforts to control uh, that outbreak in China. And, and the importance of that is he is the same guy that in 1917 was addressing the, ch the Chinese epidemic that occurred in 1917 in an area called Shanxi. Uh, we care about this because of China's connection with World War I. Uh, the Chinese were neutral, but then they weren't so neutral as, as well. They, uh, uh, they, they, they focused on a key new organization called the Chinese Labor Corps. And as we'll see, the influence in World War I and the politics of World War I had a great deal to do with the flu and the Chinese Labor Corps was an important part of that. So the epidemic was raging in Shanxi, but the war was raging on the other side of the world. China was neutral. The warring nations on both sides held concessions in China, and the Chinese sought out a way to contribute to the war while still maintaining their neutrality. In cooperation with the British and the French, they created a body of laborers that would not take part in combat, um, but they would dig trenches, mend tanks, uh, assemble shells behind the lines. So this Chinese labor corps, in a largely secret operation, hard to imagine it was very secret, uh, began in 1916. They sent 135,000 men to France and Belgium and 200,000 men to Russia, a secret operation. Uh, they came from areas in China that were affected by the flu in 1917. <laughs> And they were largely recruited by missionaries in China. And here is the oratory from one of those missionaries recruiting some of these 335,000 Chinese volunteers. 
I have come to tell you of the opportunity to see the world. Those of you who are able-bodied shall sail across two seas to the land where men look the opposite way from you to see the sky, where the buildings are as large as a walled village and cities as clean as a threshing floor. You shall work, you, you shall work there only one-third of every 24 hours, and each will receive the pay of three men while your families will be paid their food money each month here at home. You will be safe from danger, for iron masters as large as three beam houses will protect you. And when the great British king has won victory, he will send you back to your homes with enough money to buy you each a new field and a reputation that will make you esteemed for your neighbors and for posterity. And and of this I swear my honor, if it is not true when you come back, look me up. Well, you know how that ended. He wasn't around, and not many of them came back. Uh, but you can imagine that these men were transported uh, like sardines in poorly ventil ventilated holds of ships. They landed in Vancouver, and then they transferred across China to either Montreal or Halifax, for that last leg of the journey to Europe. Um, this, is, this is probably the wild, most widely held theory of the three as to where this flu began. Uh, there are accounts of men on this trip who had flu-like symptoms in the winter of 1917, 1918. Of course, there are no tissue samples to, to give evidence to it. So it is still a theory, but perhaps the best one we have. There was also a significant breakout of bronchitis in the heavily populated area of uh, northern France uh, in December of 2016, uh, which was full, as you can imagine, of military personnel. Uh, and then the last one is Camp Fuston, uh, Kansas. In January 2018, poor farmers, many of them were pig farmers, and remember that, that the connection of all of our flus to animals is either through pigs or through an aviarian flu. So many of them were pig, far pig farmers. They were falling sick and many died. The flu wasn't a reportable disease to the public health service, but then in March, the infirmary at Camp Fuston was overrun by six soldiers. This theory that the Spanish flu started here in Kansas uh, only came ab about uh, since uh, the year 2000. Uh, so so these, these, this information is, is quite recent. But all, all three theories remain on the table. And without the physical evidence, uh, it's no way of knowing for sure. Uh, but what, it, what we do know is it didn't start in Spain. Uh, the virus retreated in the spring of 1918, uh, returned in August, most significantly in Boston, particularly among dock workers who between 5 and 10 percent of those victims developed pneumonia as well and died. It spread from Boston to California, North Dakota, Florida, Texas, and most significantly, Philadelphia. Uh, on September 7, 1918, a ship from Boston landed at the Philadelphia Navy Yard and 300 soldiers disembarked. The first case was reported by the Navy base on September 18th, a little less than two weeks later, 10 days later, and within a couple days, 600 soldiers were diagnosed with the flu. Physicians recommended a quarantine to stop the spread of the flu, and this is the politics of it, but the nation was at war, and Philadelphia had planned a Liberty Loan parade for the end of September. Uh, it was designed to help the city accelerate war bond sales. Uh, the director of the public health and charities for Philadelphia allowed the parade to go forward. 200,000 people lined the streets a two-mile length of Philadelphia for this parade to raise money for war barns. Within three days, 117 civilians had died of the flu, ultimately 20 and between 20 and 40 percent of all military people had the flu, and more American soldiers died from influenza and pneumonia than from enemy weapons in Europe. Uh, Philadelphia became the American city with the highest, most rapidly accumulating death toll. Uh, the randomness of the flu seemed to, ch there was a randomness, but the flu also chose victims. Um, so humans 
shaped this pandemic uh, by their unequal positions in society, uh, by the places that they built their homes, by the diet that they had, uh, and by their rituals, and also by their DNA. If you lived in Asia, you were 30 times as likely to die from the flu uh, than if you lived in Europe. Cities tend to suffer more than rural areas, and some cities like Philadelphia suffered more than others. Bad diet, crowded living, poor access to health care, all a weakened constitution, uh, the poor, the immigrants, ethnic minorities, and more were all more susceptible to the disease. Uh, for instance, in Russia, the tremendous political turmoil and economic turmoil that was taking place in Russia undermined any planning to, to deal with, with the flu there. And it reached its peak in September, uh, the same year that, that it, it uh, reached its peak here. Uh, and there, hunger, cold, darkness, pestilence, bribery, robbery, raids, killings, all contributed to its return the following February. In Alaska, uh, the flu swept in autumn of 2018, starting with northbound ships. But the Aleuts, the, you know, uh, the, the uh, original residents of Alaska, on the outer, outer islands were largely spared because of their remoteness. But then in the spring of 1919, when the sea ice began to break up, fishing boats came, came north and the flu came with them and went everywhere in Alaska. The number of, um, of fatalities was all over the lot. At the end of, uh, I think there's a, a little post there, at the, at the end of, of the flu, the epidemic, uh, the English estimated that there were six million victims worldwide. Uh, in the 1920s, there was a, uh, a uh, respected American bacteriologist named Edward uh, Jordan who estimated that there were 21.6 million that died of the flu. But 1998, with the kind of modern technology and modern science we have to, to evaluate this, uh, the estimate that we use today was established, and that is somewhere between 50 and 100 million people died worldwide. Very, very different depending on where you live. So, so the, the flu pandemics usually kill about one-tenth of one percent of the victims. Uh, the Spanish flu killed about two and a half percent of the victims. Um, one in three people had fallen ill, and uh, something between, of those who fall ill, something between five and one-tenth, one tenth, fifth and one-tenth of those actually died. Um, using sophisticated uh, science methodology that wasn't available in the 1920s when these first estimates were made, um, we think that in, the, in Great Britain and the United States, it was about a half a percent of those who contracted the flu actually died. Uh, in Russia, it was 1.2 percent, or 2.7 million people. In India, it was 10 times the rate as in the United States. And then there's China, which had frequent outbreaks of uh, respiratory disease and, and very little uh, uh, record keeping. Uh, it's estimated that anywhere's up to nine, nine and a half million people perished in China. Um, so in 1988, a team of historians and geographers came up with that current estimate, admitting that they could be wrong by a factor of 100%. <laughs> so, and a lot of that has to do with the record keeping that took place at the time, with the fact that, that there were not tissue samples to examine to ex actually see what was going on in, in all the communities and so forth. And by the way, that changed a lot as a result of the Spanish flu of 1918. The record keeping changed and the methodology of, of determining what actually happened changed that, 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 that actually covered future events. But they determined that Asia actually represented 30 million of those possible 100 million deaths. Um, and then uh, there was the, the dissemination mechanism uh, in the thick autumn of the flu. Uh, there was, at one point, there was a demobilization taking place because it was the end of World War I. There were a large number of troops that were coming back. There were public celebrations. There were gatherings that all contributed to an expansion of the flu throughout 
everywhere in the United States. Who was susceptible? We know today that most people that are most susceptible to the flu are either seniors or the very young. That was a little different with this. It was actually directed, the flu actually approached a group of people who were aged between 20 and 40 years old. Uh, pregnant women were 50% more likely to get the flu. They were 50% more likely to develop pneumonia if they got the flu. And they were 50% more likely to die. Uh, the lasting effects have been documented. And the lasting effects come forward toward us. So for instance, during the draft of 1941, when, when we as a country were examining all the people who were being drafted to fight in World War II, it was determined that the men who, who actually had survived the flu as children were more likely to be shorter and have more persistent health issues. And then your best chance of surviving was to be utterly selfish. Assuming you had a place that you called home, the optimum strategy was to stay there, don't answer the door, jealously guard your hoard of food and water, and ignore all pleas of help. If everyone did that, the, dens the, the density of susceptible people to the flu would actually go behind, below the threshold of it being an epidemic. And of course, it would extinguish itself. But people didn't do this, of course. Thank God they didn't do this. Um, depending on where they lived, uh, they, they really couldn't do this at all. And beyond that, doctors tell us that uh, to keep away from infected individuals during the outbreak, we actually go the other way. You know, we, we want to help them. And, and we did that. And of course, doctors did the opposite as well. And they worked long hours, sometimes uh, seeing 60 patients a day. Uh, vaccines weren't developed until much, much later. Uh, the first mass flu vaccine containing in inactivated viruses uh, was available in 1944 to our military personnel in World War II. In Philadelphia, 26% of the physicians and a much larger percent of nurses actually were already serving in the military and not available to treat the flu at home. 75% of the hospital medical staffs were actually overseas. So, so besides approaching this epidemic, we were doing it shorthanded. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, Governor Michael Brumbau set out a proclamation on October 18th ordering nurses to leave private care and come to the aid of the general public. Uh, the flu wasn't required as a, as a reporting uh, disease to the boards of health until, until in, we were into the flu, actually. But that changed very, very quickly, and they convened to take measures to make the disease reportable. The first victim in Philadelphia was actually a victim in Bucks County, was uh, B.J. Taylor, the president of the First National Bank of Bristol, who was 89 years old at the time. Uh, and by, by, by then, the disease among sailors and Marines had so taxed the Navy hospital that 150 beds at the municipal hospital for contagious diseases was turned over to the Navy. And you'll see some pictures probably up here of, of just what that looked like. And that's not two, two people to a room. That's 150 people to a room uh, in beds that hopefully had a, had a fabric divider between them. Uh, but, but not what we would say would be the right conditions for, uh, for reducing the uh, infections of a disease. On October 5th, 50 cases were reported in the Doylestown Democrat. And the Doylestown Democrat becomes our source for a lot of information as to what happened locally. Um, 50 cases were reported in the Doylestown Democrat on October 5th for the previous 24 hours. Uh, the Doylestown physicians, just like nationwide, uh, were reduced below normal numbers because of enlistments in the Army. And they were unable to see the patients that were here, the, the doctors that were here were unable to see patients, although they worked the same hours that doctors were working on the front in France. They worked from dawn until midnight and then had some short break after that. The local Board of Health closed all hotels and wholesale liquor stores. 
the Doylestown Democrat reported that, quote, many who were out early in the morning for their eye opener before breakfast were confronted by closed bar door, do, bar barroom doors with a sign that said, closed by order of the Board of Health. Anticipated the night before, because these bars closed at midnight and were closed going forward. So, so people knew that this was going to occur. So anticipated the night before, the business did the big business before the midnight no notices went up. In addition, the next morning, the Board of Health closed soda and water fountains in compliance with the State Board of Health. Uh, local authorities were given the, the uh, authority to close or not to close uh, churches, uh, Sunday schools and schools. Uh, our authorities closed them all. Uh, and the violations were uh, fines of $100 or imprisonment for one month or both. As best we know, no one went to jail and no one got fined. But there was a heck of a lot of grumbling, and I can tell you from the reading, a lot of the grumbling went from the saloon owners who argued that actually their product was helpful in recovering from the flu. <laughs> you can see how that would work. And by the way, a lot of the stuff that you bought at the local uh, grocery store or uh, drugstore happened to have alcohol as a major component of the ingredients. Um, so the Democrat actually said, quote, everyone who received the order took it in a manner with good grace. That is a little bit of fake news. <laughs> uh, the nurses engaged in caring for the sick visited about 60 homes a day, not unlike the doctors. And then they reported back to the Board, board of Health some of the uh, conditions that they saw, and indeed, uh, some of the conditions in individual homes were such that the Board of Health had, had, to, uh, had to step in. Uh, the first fatality actually in Doylestown was a man named Walter Kelly on East Oakland Avenue, sort of across the street from me. He was 33 years old and he worked for Nice Bottling Company. Um, so the Doylestown Democrat published these extensive articles on influenza and how to avoid it for householders and then also when you were at work. Uh, and then they reported locally uh, on a daily basis exactly what was going on. And it was extremely detailed. It would never pass the muster of our current health standards. I mean, here's, here's one of them. G. Cleveland Clark, son of Mr. and Mrs. Noah Clark, is still very critically ill, the crisis in his case having not yet passed. Mr. Clark had just recovered from a severe attack of scarlet fever when he was afflicted with influenza, which developed into pneumonia." Unquote. Too much information, maybe. And then on October 15th, there were two deaths reported in Doylestown, as well as two more in Alaska. And then there were some interesting ways of fighting the flu. The firemen in Norristown turned on hoses on all the sidewalks and streets hoping to drown out the influenza. Then there were communities much more worse off than ours that were not terribly bigger. Easton and Phillipsburg, uh, in Phillipsburg, New Jersey, had uh, 56 deaths reported. Uh, in a community in Phillipsburg of 145 houses, it was reported that 100 of the homes had flu outbreaks in the home. Uh, uh, the stories uh, make their way into a message of how to conduct yourself. There was an article that told of uh, Mrs. Margaret Higgins being ill. I don't know who Mrs. Margaret Higgins is, but the important information is that she was the chief operator of the Bell Telephone Company. And then the notice appeared in the paper that goes like this, an advertisement in the paper. In need for a f your help is in need for a few days more. Your generous response to our former appeal has so far served the most critical situation and your telephone service has e ever faced. Today, more telephone operators are absent on account of the epidemic than at any previous time. The situation continues to be so critical that it is necessary for us to ask you the help by making only absolutely essential calls for a few more days. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea whether the response was favorable or not. One would, one would hope it was. 
So th the call for volunteer nurses went out, and the visiting, visiting nurses were greatly relieved by a host of new volunteers. And this brings one of our favorite organizations to the front. On October 7th, Mrs. William Mercer, the head of the Dawestown branch of the Red Cross, sent out this call. Quote, graduates of first, class, first aid classes and home nursing classes, and anyone who can help in nursing, are asked to report to the Red Cross rooms in the armory as soon as possible. Mrs. Howard Atkinson, commissary of the Red Cross, was assisting making soup, not taking soup, but going to someone's home and making soup for the sick, particularly uh, in homes where five or seven are in bed. Uh, and it was also reported in the paper how the doctors were faring. Dr. Jones is suffering from the flu, but is somehow managing to make his rounds. Every day you could see how, how Dr. Jones was doing. So our community dealt with this crisis in a rather aggressive and also uh, forward-looking fashion. The VIA had started a hospital fund in 2006 and then uh, had uh, established the OP James Ambulance in 2015. Uh, and we're fortunate that the VIA actually started a visiting nurse program in 2016, uh, two years before it would be tested to the extreme uh, by the influenza of 2018. In no, no small way, the response to the flu in 2018 created a new effort at response here in Doylestown and new determination for the VIA to establish its Doylestown Hospital, its first Doylestown Hospital. With so many medical personnel sent to Europe, Reliance on visiting nurses made the difference between communities that suffered greatly and communities that suffered less and recovered more quickly. The first two visiting nurses left to join the medical corps in World War I uh, in 1916. Uh, however, there was a replacement. Remember when you go to the Memorial Day Parade and you see that woman on a bicycle that's part of the VIA? That's Miss Muncie. Miss Muncie joined the visiting nurse program in October of 1917. She became an instant figure in our community on her bicycle on the streets throughout town. She arranged a room at the local elementary school and introduced preventive health care, in, including dental examinations. She made, in October of 1918, during the, the height of the flu epidemic, 741 home visits in and around Doylestown. Uh, the next year, after the flu was over, the VIA established uh, rooms near the courthouse to act as emergency rooms. In 1921, Ms. Muncie hired an assistant, Ms. Hannah Haddock, who had helped her on a temporary basis during the 1918 epidemic. The death toll for the county was reported. The Dem Dem Dalston Democrat reported uh, on October 10th that seven deaths had been reported in Bristol in the previous 24 hours, uh, ending that previous noon. On October 8th, the local Board of Health decided to close one more important institution. The ice cream saloons were closed. It was the last only remaining source of communicating disease left uncovered as best they knew. So by October 22nd, 1918, the county medical inspector of Bucks County was beginning to report the fall off of cases. His name is Dr. Schwartz Plymer. Um, he was making daily reports on the influenza, and at the end, he said the number of cases in the county were 8,350. Uh, and this is when the discussion of the action to, to remove the uh, ban on churches, theaters, movie picture houses, saloons, and other places of public assemblies took place. Uh, most of those bans were lifted uh, uh, around the end of October. Uh, some of them probably were lifted too early uh, because there was a modest increase in, in influenza uh, incidents into uh, the first part of November, and then there was also a little spike in influenza uh, incidences uh, over Christmas time. So at the end, there were 28, there were 30, 38 deaths that occurred in Doylestown. The townships of Doylestown, New Britain, Warrington, Plumstead, and Warwick, 28 of those 38 had pneumonia as a secondary condition that contributed to the death. 
uh, 10 died in Doylestown. Now, some records say, say seven. Keep in mind, record keeping was more or less an art, not a science at that point, but, but some, something between seven and 10 died in Doylestown, which is actually a pretty modest number. Um, on the same day that, uh, that that was being reported, 711 people died on that day in Philadelphia. Um, in Doylestown, we had about 300 people who suffered from the flu. Uh, in Percocy, they had 951. Uh, so it shouldn't be lost in our community that this group of determined women were largely responsible for our success in addressing the worst pandemic of documented history. Um, there, were, there were those flare-ups I mentioned. Uh, and by the way, the H1N1 flu strain that called, caused the Spanish flu was extinct until 2005, has been recreated, and now exists in an imprisoned, high-security containment facility in Atlanta, Georgia. So most of those studies, even though the flu occurred 100 years ago, most of the studies are recent. Uh, 2007 studies showed that public health measures such as banning mass gatherings cut the death toll by 50% in the cities where, the, where it actually took place. Timing was crucial. Measures against public gatherings such as had to be introduced very early and had to be kept in place until the danger had clearly passed. And there was lots of pressure from the businesses and institutions involved and churches involved to do anything but that. Um, so by the end of October, the public places were reopened, the quarantines were lifted, and by the spring of 1919, when the totals really came out, there had been 12,191 deaths in Philadelphia. Official estimates put the, uh, uh, for the state were 350,000 cases of the flu, 150,000 of those 350,000 cases were in Philadelphia. And by the end of the spring of 1919, when that third wave had passed, and es estimated 625,000 Americans had died. There were economic costs. The global reshuffle, reshuffle uh, left long-term invalids. Widows had no way of coping because, or, or of finding another husband. Uh, and orphans had no one who wanted them. The flu targeted those between 20 and 40. And that was a bit different. Uh, and many of dependents were deprived of their primary breadwinners. Uh, but then there were also lucky beneficiaries of life insurance. You remember that at this time, life insurance was sold, you know, door to door. And it was sold particularly to new immigrants. So the U.S. life insurance industry paid out $100 million in claims from the pandemic. That's the equivalent of $20 billion today. They paid out that. Um, so upon the death of one immigrant in New York, his widow and her son, or their son, received a sum of money. We don't know how much. And they invested it in property in New York. That immigrant's grandson is Donald Trump. Most people were not nearly as fortunate. I mean, there are few reliable statistics, but where they, where they are, they do give you a message. There are an estimated 500,000 children who were orphaned in South Africa alone. The statistics are really overwhelming. Amazingly, industrial output only took a serious hit in 1918, but when economists did a state-by-state -state study, uh, the higher the death rate, the higher the growth in per capita income through the 1920s. Um, it wasn't necessarily new wealth, but it was the capacity of society to bounce back after a violent shock. Uh, and then in the years following the pandemic, uh, the reporting of health data became more systematic. The governments beefed up their, their epidemic uh, preparedness. Uh, many countries reorganized their, their health care ministries. Most, most people, most historians are not are reluctant to suggest that the flu altered the outcome of World War I, but it certainly accelerated the end. It played a role at the Paris Peace Talks. Um, Woodrow Wilson 
suffered from the flu at the Paris Peace Talks, and may have actually suffered from a series of many strokes at the same time caused by the flu. So the legacy is that there are 80,000 books on World War I, and there are 400 books on the Spanish flu. And actually, a couple of them come from authors around here. So I'm very reluctant and nervous about, about being up here today. Because, because among, among our community, there are a lot of ex experts who have written articles for the intelligencer and have written books themselves. And of course, then there's Downton Abbey, you know, <laughs> where three main characters had the Spanish flu, and one of them died. Um, it killed horribly. Uh, more than any other flu pandemic we know of, yet 90% of those who caught it uh, were no worse for it and lived healthy lives after that. So thank you. Uh, I have to say, in preparation for this, I felt like I was an undergraduate college student <laughs> writing a thesis on, on a subject I do nothing about before I started reading and, and before Milt handed me uh, uh, reams of material about. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you very much for coming and happy spring, everyone.